Welcome to the Gospel According to Kennison. And I am Bill Kennison, and as you can see, I'm missing my beautiful signer, Susie Phillips. It is New Year's Eve, and uh, she has other things physically that have come up and unable to be here today, and we will miss her. I feel like I'm I'm just half the half the ministry is here. And I can't I can't sign, so I hope the deaf community can read my lips well enough. And anyhow, I'm excited to bring a new lesson to you. We're going to start a new series today called From Sinners to Sons. But it's not going to be the typical uh, teaching that, that you have out for you that's been watching us. Uh, uh, you've already figured out we're not, we're not real typical. Uh, I, had, I had an interesting uh, thing. Um, I won't mention his name, but a recognized uh, actor and director. We were, Sharon and I were at a party this week. And uh, he watches our show. And so he said, uh, why don't you ever ask for money? And I said, well, that's not our, our priority. If they want to send money, I'll gladly take it. But uh, uh, that's that's not our priority. And he was, I think he was teasing. He goes, well, you're not a real preacher then. Because real preachers ask for money. And uh, and I said, well, I don't know. I don't, I, I, you know, there for a long time, I didn't even like to be called a a preacher. I like, I like to think that maybe I'm just uh, an individual, a man that uh, loves God, that feels like God has given me an insight into the Word of God uh, that would help people. But yeah, I thought that was uh, very, very uh, interesting and, and entertaining, to be very honest with you. It's a beautiful day. We're coming to you live from sunny Southern California, I know the rest of the country is really going through things where I came from. I think their high yesterday was 9, and their high today is supposed to be 12. That was up in Rockford, Illinois. And I see all the snow, and and I used to hear preachers, if they came from Texas or whatever they call it, God's country. I got to tell you, I think we're out here in God's country. It's going to be 85 today. It's beautiful. It's sunny. It's Southern California. You can't ask for any better weather than this. I do want to also uh, wish everyone a happy new year. And uh, I had mixed emotions on happy, on, on New Year's, on New Year's Eve. My birthday is tomorrow on New Year's. And I always thought as a child, I thought, man, I always get cheated on this stuff. And I think my parents thought I was a little slow because I always got a present or two less than my brothers at Christmas time. And then I figured out after a certain point that what they were doing is holding back presents and giving them to me on, on my birthday, which was a week later on New Year's Day. Also, I never got to have any uh, birthday parties, at least not on my, not on my birthday like other kids did. And, uh, and uh, also another thing, I shouldn't even be telling you all this, but I will. I, I don't hide anything from you. We grew up, and in our church, we always had a a New Year's Eve service. And uh, I'm going to be very honest with you, I hated them. I hated them. We would, first we'd be there all night, and as children or a young person, man, you're wore out, and uh, and we just, we would just bide time. That's basically what we would do. We'd sing songs, and we'd drag out everything, what was regular service from, from 8 to 10, we're going from 8 to 12, so we're actually dragging it out for four hours, and I always thought, you know, whenever I get old enough and big enough and I get out of this out of this church and out of churches, I'm, I'm never going to another New Year's Eve service. And um, I remember Sherry and I were pastoring our first church, and sure enough, here we come New Year's Eve, and, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking you out to a beautiful dinner, and we're going to dance, and we're going to have a good time. We're going to go with some friends. And she said, we're not going to have a service. I go, no, we're not going to have a service. Just too late. And uh, and the theme was always the same. You know, he's going to uh, 2018, wasn't any different than 1959. Uh, great things are going to happen this next year. God's going to do this and that. And I just thought, man, I'm, I've had enough of those New Year's Eve uh, services. But I do want to wish you a happy New Year's, whatever you're doing. If you're, if 
you're going to be in church, God bless you. I hope you have a great service. Uh, us in particular, uh, Sherry and I aren't even going to be together tonight. I'll be at the theater. We have a New Year's Eve uh, show that we do with, uh, and this year it is with Abbey Road, a Beatles, uh, Beatles tribute band that is fantastic. I'll be with them. Sherry actually sings uh, back up in, in uh, a group that does Elvis shows, Elvis tributes. So they'll be doing their own show tonight. And so we won't even be able to, we'll just have to do our kissing when we get home and, and run into each other. But I want to wish you a, a happy New Year's. Want to get in get into this new series that we're going to be getting. And I, I have to make a few disclaimers that uh, when you start, when you uh, listen to us, if you're brand new, the best thing for you to do just for 30 minutes is set aside the foundations of your belief. Because what you believe is but what has been reiterated to you from that person that has been reiterated to them, and it's went on for literally a couple hundred years where it keeps getting passed down, passed down, passed down. I just want you for 30 minutes to open your mind, open your eyes, and listen to what we have, what God has put in our heart. Somebody said, why should I listen to you and not listen to this other preacher? Well, first, I don't have anyone to answer to. So I don't have to worry about a board firing me or an organization throwing me out. I can literally give you what is down in my heart. And I'm not worried about uh, you sending money or not sending money. That isn't how uh, my ministry works anyway. And I'm not belittling uh, any other ministry because it does take money uh, to, to run uh, their ministries. They have created such an organization that it takes money to do that. But we're just, that's just not our priority. I want to uh, begin with, uh, once I've told you that, the other thing is, if you happen to be a first time uh, listener and viewer, that uh, you're going to find out I'm not the traditional uh, teacher and preacher that, that you usually have listened to. Uh, some of the things that I say may be a little alarming to you. They were to me when God put them in my heart. I, I've, told, I've said many times, I studied the Bible to prove what I believed was wrong. And I never saw anything wrong with that because if I could prove it was wrong, then it was wrong. If it's right, I could not prove it was wrong, but I would find so much more revelation that God put in our heart. And I believe that this ministry is a ministry that if you were going to school, I have a, a little granddaughter, and I said this last week, a beautiful little granddaughter that's a gift from God, Scarlet Rose, and uh, she's she's in kindergarten. She's five years old. She's in kindergarten. They're teaching her to read and to write and to uh, use her numbers and learn the number system, and she's doing fantastic. She just loves to... Now she's counting everything. But if I would come along with, uh, with algebra or geometry or anything else that's going to come later on in life, uh, she would never understand that right now. The good news is she's not going to stay there. She's going to graduate and go to first grade, second grade, third grade. I wish we could do that spiritually. Because we come down to the altar and we think that's the end of the road. That's the end of the journey. We have to just hang on till Jesus comes and rescues us out of here before it gets too bad. And I've heard that that could be any time my entire life, which is only almost 69 years. And uh, I figured out years ago, you know what? Maybe I should learn how to be an overcomer and not wait for this rescue that is supposed to happen. Maybe I should be an overcomer to overcome the things that we face. So I think we teach a deeper ministry, but we keep it uh, simple. Uh, Jesus one time said that uh, that it should be so simple a child should understand, be able to understand it. Uh, Christianity, and we'll get right into this, Christianity has been exclusive. It has been segregated. It has been sectarian. 
I remember Martin Luther King one time said the most segregated hour of the week was from 11 to 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. And I have to uh, have to agree with him. Back then and, and even to this day, man hungers for freedom. He hungers from freedom from what? From oppression, from sickness, from uh, most of all, he wants freedom from his own fears. Well, I got to be honest with you. Christianity and religion has failed to open the way to those freedoms. Matter of fact, a lot of times it has restricted those freedoms even more than when you became involved. You see, in the simple but dynamic teachings of Jesus Christ, we have a message that is universal and it's practical that he, he taught us. And it's all throughout the Bible. We just have to, we just have to accept it. The teachings of, of Jesus contain the keys to the kingdom of health and prosperity and peace and freedom. That's exactly what it contains. Why are we not exercising these things? Well, first, because they're usually not taught to us. We're taught to whatever that organization or that church believes, not necessarily what the teachings of Jesus were. Now, when they, they tell you, well, this is what Jesus said, it's usually their interpretation of what he said. And I think we're all subject to that a little bit. The central theme, now I want you to really get this. The central theme of Christianity hope you're ready, has been sin and evil. That has been the central theme of Christianity, is to deliver you from sin and to keep you away from, from evil. We have been taught more about hell than we have heaven. I really want you to just stop and think about it. We have been taught more about the devil than we have about God. And it's come from church. I was raised, as um, all of you that have ever listened to me, I usually remind you every week, I was raised Pentecostal. And uh, it's like I've said many times on the social ladder of Christianity, you probably got Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Methodists, all down the list. Way down on the ladder, you'll find Pentecost. It's usually about a rung above the snake handlers. Somebody said, well, yeah, you know, I happen to be Pentecost. Well, I was raised Pentecost, so. And if I had life to do over, I'd, I'd want to do the same thing. Uh, it was very emotional. I loved the services. I loved God. I just didn't love the fear that was always taught to us. And I didn't like the insecurity that was always taught to us. We were like, oh, we were like, uh, an alcoholic. You go to an AA meeting and uh, the amazing thing about if you're an alcoholic is that you're never cured. I mean, if you have cancer and you're clean for five years, they say you're cured, that you're cured of cancer. You never, according to uh, AA meetings and to alcoholics, you're never not an alcoholic. The rest, I mean, if you all know my story, if you watched uh, I Am uh, Sam Kennison on Spike TV last week, which I thought was a fantastic documentary, or you've read my book, Brother Sam, uh, I'm very open about it. I, I took a, a drug hit from my brother at the airport and in Los Angeles at LAX, I ended up doing five five months in a rehab. And I didn't even drink. And instead of these people, <laughs> instead of them loving me or, or being friends or whatever, uh, they were actually insulted by me because when uh, I had to say something, and I get up and say my name is Bill, and they go, and? And I go, it's just Bill. And then they'd start going, denial, denial. And I go, what, whatever, whatever way you want to see it. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. Uh, I'm here on a court order. And uh, 
but it reminds me of how I was raised in church. In our church, you were so insecure. They raised you so insecure that we got saved, what you call saved or converted. We came down to the altar and asked the Lord to forgive us and put us back on the right way every Sunday night, if we needed it or not. Matter of fact, if you didn't come down, they knew you really needed to come down because that's what we did. That's how insecure. In other words, we never had a security that was taught to us that God never leaves us. They would say it, but we didn't act it. That God would never leave us. He would never forsake us. And uh, he would always be with us. But man, if we thought a bad thought, boom, everything was gone. If he comes at the wrong time, you're going to hell. So that, that's, not very, that's not very secure. Though we have a, a picture of Jesus' mastery, man has been pictured as a poor, miserable sinner. I want you to think about that. Think about the two different pictures. The picture of Jesus, of the supreme overcomer, could never do anything wrong, was perfect, but every other man is a poor, miserable sinner that we've got to we've got to try to hang on. Matter of fact, our testimony used to be, uh, I pray the Lord lets me hold on to the end. Well, how about if he's got a hold of you instead of you having a hold of him? You see, there's been kind of a hopelessness in Christianity's attitude toward man. There just is a, a hopelessness. Uh, first, we didn't, we were so segregated and we were so oppressed that we believed, and I'm sincerely, we sincerely believe that if you were not a member of our church, you wouldn't get into heaven. And we would look around in our church and we knew that most of the people sitting in there weren't going to get to heaven either unless the Lord happened to come right after a Sunday night service before you had any chance to, th to think bad or do something wrong or cuss or have a smoke or, or have a drink or anything else. And, uh, and that, was the, that was the insecurity that was taught to us. Now, it has been taught that man is a sinner. That's what they taught to us. That's what you've always heard. Man is a sinner. And he's going to be a sinner yesterday, today, and forever. He is a sinner. Well, I started thinking, how did all this come about in Christianity? So I started looking in the historical events, and I started looking in the Bible, and I realized that Jesus discovered a divine dimension in man. He discovered it in himself. A divine dimension that man had not, had not discovered before. And he proved that man can live in it and find fulfillment through it. Because he did. And he did it as a man. Now, before y'all shut me off, hang on, and I'll, I only got another 12, 15 minutes. He did it as a man. Now, I told you I started looking at, historically, I started looking it up in a historical study of the evolution of the historic creeds of the Christian church is amazingly revealing, perhaps to me it was even startling and disturbing what I found. The doctrine of original sin. Now, for you that don't know what that is, because we have most of you, I think, probably we're not grounded in church, and I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, the doctrine of original sin, that was back when Adam and Eve sinned. And I always wondered about that. First, God makes a garden, the Garden of Eden. 
and he makes Adam, and then he, out of the dust of the earth, and then he takes a rib and he makes Eve. Now you have to remember that God knows the end from the beginning. In other words, before it starts, he knows how it's going to wind up. So he makes them and he puts them in this garden. And they don't have the right of decision. Uh, let me how I can explain that even better. They don't know what's right and what's wrong because they, they, they don't have that knowledge. Now Jesus, or uh, God, I'm sorry, God puts them in this garden and he tells them, you can eat of every tree in this garden except for that one. Well, I think they were kind of set up. Somebody said, why? Well, if God didn't want them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just take it out. Just don't put it there. It's almost like children. You tell them, you put something somewhere and go, don't touch that. You know they're going to go touch it. And God wasn't surprised with Adam and Eve. They weren't surprised with Eve taking it and, and, uh, and giving it to Adam. And all of a sudden, they got the knowledge of what was right and what was wrong. Somebody said, well, that's good. Well, no, what they needed was the knowledge of God. Anyway, I don't want to get just stuck on that. But the doctrine of what Christianity calls the original sin, that's the original sin, did not come out of Jesus' teaching. You don't read any place in the teachings of Jesus that he calls that an original sin or about Adam and Eve. You see, it was a deliberate creation of theologians in the early stages of Christianity. That's where it came from. It was formulated to offset a trend toward rationalization among Christian scholars. So they had to come up with something. What they came up was, with was the original sin. In what theologians call the age of speculation, I hope I'm not losing you with all these terms. It's, I want to keep it very simple and entertaining. There crept into the Christian movement the so-called heresy of Gnosticism. Now, Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, means knowledge. The Gnostics, those that followed that, felt that they had a superior knowledge from an inner illumination so that they felt themselves to be superior to Christians, and they also felt they were equal or superior to Jesus. So they had to, they had to come up with something to keep the people humble, to keep them down where they could control them. And this, was, this teaching was, uh, this was heresy to Christian leaders. And in order to offset that movement among the theologians, the leaders of the church met and drew up Decree stating that Jesus was very God. He was not just God, he was very God. That he was God who had come down from out there, had put on clothes as a man and walked among men, yet he was in no way human. That was what they, they actually came up with. That's why you had the view of Jesus that you have. To make the distinction between Jesus and other men, they did that to, to make it unmistakable that Jesus was here, men, other men were down here. The doctrine was formulated of the degradation of man. It was to keep you down. Remember the thing I told you about the alcoholics? Well, this was to keep you down, that uh, you know, you're a sinner. Matter of fact, in churches, they'll tell you, you're a sinner saved by grace. Well, that's the same thing as an alcoholic going, you know, I've been uh, 20 years, I've been, I haven't had a drink, but I'm an alcoholic. That, that's the same thing they were trying to do here. The original sin by which man would be forever cursed with the stigma of humanity. Now, I want to I wanna show you where this came from in the next few minutes. This point was exploited by the Christian pulpits. 
by the Christian preachers and, and ministers and teachers, this point was, was uh, exploited. Actually, this statement is taken out of context. I want to uh, read to you out of Psalms 51 because this is the central position that uh, Christians have, have taken. And it was David, and he said, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, if you've been in any kind of church, you've heard that probably many, many, many times. I was born in sin and raised in iniquity. I remember my dad used to go the age of accountability was 12 years old. So as children, if you died and you weren't 12, you got to go to heaven. If you were 12... If you had not given your, your heart to the Lord, you were going to hell at 12 years old. I mean, that's just how we thought, and that was because we believe we were born in sin and we were raised in iniquity. Now, this statement is taken out of context of the inspirational nature of the Psalms in the Bible. Most of the Psalms are, are wonderful in man's eternal song of the soul, but... A few of the psalms are psalms of pain and despair. And that's what Psalms 51 is, which is where this came from. I'm gonna, I'll give you this and then we're going to close. The prophet Nathan had just reprimanded David. And he, he was really harsh on him for his horrible act of sending the husband of Bathsheba, if you know the story, to his death in battle so he could have Bathsheba as his own. So he might as well have just killed him because he put him in the front lines to have him killed, and he was killed, and the prophet Nathan is just ripping him about this. You know, how could you do this? Well, David is remorseful, and he's talking to himself over his sins. Now, I think probably at our lowest moments, I know I have. I've told the Lord, and I think probably most of you at your lowest moments have said, I'm no good. I wish I'd have never been born. My, my life is a mess. My life is, I, I've just screwed up everything. Everything's bad. Well, this is what David was doing. David is imagining that he must have been born in sin and in sin, in sin conceived to be able to do such a horrible act that he did. Well, religion has taken those words of remorse and despair and has given them a central place in their theology. And I won't get into it all this morning, but it's really uh, to keep you down and keep you in bondage and keep you in church. It doesn't make sense, but that's exactly uh, what happened. I want to read to you Psalms 8, and then we will close. In Psalms 8, now remember what he said in Psalms 51. I was born in sin, raised in iniquity. Here's what he says in Psalms 8. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him, for thou hast made him but little lower than God, and it crownest him with a glory and honor. Thou makest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. Ah, it's a beautiful message. We're going to pick this up next week. But I wanted to just, I wanted to make it clear you're sons of God. You're not sinners. That price has been paid. And uh, you can walk around and say you're a sinner saved by grace, but, but uh, you're a son of God. I don't care. Somebody said, I don't go to church. I don't care. I don't care what you've done. Uh, we're going to pray for a few, few people. Then we're going to let you go. I want to, uh, want to pray for Gigi and Richard that watch us on Sunday morning, uh, Richard's going through some things. Uh, Donna Weiss, a very, very close friend of Sherry and I's uh, brother, was was killed a couple of nights ago. I want to remember the Weiss family, and I want to remember the 
Chris Hernandez family, and uh, we want to pray. Father, I ask that you touch these people. I ask that you cause a revolution to come into their life. God, give them peace. Give them strength. I don't care what the doctor's reports are. You are the creator, and we are your temple. You're living inside of us. We control our destiny, and I ask that you cause that Christ in them to, to jump up and take control of every situation. I thank you for the victory you're going to give us in each one of these situations, and every person listening to me, bless them financially, bless them physically, bless them emotionally, bless their home, touch every avenue of their life, and I'll give you all the praise. Amen. Happy New Year to you. We'll be back next week. We're all going to be a year older. Have a good 2018. Happy New Year. Oh, Sherry's, Sherry's saying happy. There she is. Happy New Year. Some of you want to know what my wife looks like. She just popped around here. One of these days, I might have her sitting next to me. But anyway, God love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.